All right, so I'm going to continue on. I started a series. It's been two Sundays ago now. We had some issues last week. But um, if you remember two weeks ago, I preached a sermon on old-fashioned values. And what we did was we started comparing our current culture with the culture of America in the 1950s. And the topic that we pretty much focused on last time was the gender roles. The roles of men and women in the family and the family structure and what was, what was just expected in that time period. And what we did was, I found this website and I have more of this today. There's quotes from people who are remembering the time period of the 50s and their, their uh, recollections and these writings that I have that I'm going to be going off of today, that's kind of the, 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 the source of information for the sermon. It has nothing to do with religion. It's not from a religious website. It's not from people who even said one way or the other which culture they think is better. Sometimes you could tell from the writings that they think it was kind of silly the things that were going on back when they, you know, in the 50s when they lived in this time frame versus now. Whatever. That's not important. What we're going to be looking at today is not because we don't care what, what their opinion is. I'm using these as first-hand witnesses of people who have no motivation to lie about it anyways. And just to confirm what you might... I mean, I wasn't born up and brought up in the 50s. I have no idea. I wasn't alive during this time. So all I can do is go off of other people's witness, their first-hand witness and their testimony on what things were like. But there's no ulterior motive to, the, to these writings. It's not, it's not you know, Baptists saying, oh man, look at how great things were back then. It's not anything like that. But um, it's just, it, to me, it seems very factual. And from everything I've heard and other people I've talked to, these are very factual. And there, there's no discrepancy about that anyways, as far as I know of. But um, what we're looking at, though, is these statements. And I've pulled out the ones that are more positive. At least last time I did that, for sure. The ones where, hey, in the 50s, America was doing things right and they were doing things based off of biblical principles, and here's why. So I'm going to be doing something similar today, except not exactly the same. The more of the focus today isn't, isn't necessarily that everything that was being done in the 50s was right, because there was still, what, we're, what I'm looking at is the world. The world at the time of the 50s versus the world of today. Now, the world is always sinful. The world always is, is, is contrary to God. But the culture of the world back then was way different. And, and what I'm going to be doing is pointing out the stark differences like I did last time. So this isn't to, to say that, oh, everything that was done in the 50s was just awesome and biblical and scriptural and that we should be accepting that. Because what I'm dealing with tonight is entertainment. So last time I did gender roles. This evening we'll be looking at the entertainment of the 50s. So I'm not saying that, oh, all of these things, all the TV shows and movies, and just if you just look at, watch the stuff from the 50s, then you're great, it's good, and it's, you know, no, I'm not saying that it's good. The point is to point out the extreme difference in a matter of 60 years. How much, to how much 60 years makes a difference in the culture of our country? And some of this stuff might blow you away. Now, we started off in 1 Peter chapter 3. Because, and we're focusing on the verses in just a minute. But if you think about what's most commonly spoken about, just out in the world, at your job, or just whatever, most people aren't like sitting around talking about religion. And it comes up from time to time, right? Most people aren't really sitting around talking about politics every once in a while during election years and things that are going on. Yeah, that comes up a little bit. But generally, when I, I know when I overhear conversations at work, when these conversations are going on, it's going to be about TV, movies, music, and sports. Those are like, I mean, it's entertainment, right? These are things that people do outside of work that they end up talking about. And people always oh, say, oh, did you see this TV show and that TV show or this movie and that movie? These are the things that people talk about, right? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. 
This is talking about your mind being prepared and girded up. And, and he says, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. He's saying, you know, back before you got saved or even after you got saved, when, when you were ignorant and you were fashioning yourselves after the world, when you're doing all these worldly things, he says, don't go back to those former lusts that you were participating in in your own ignorance. Because now you have the truth. He said, gird up the loins of your mind. Get your mind prepared and ready and be sober. Be serious about this. You need to be obedient children. He says in verse 15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. Look at this. In all manner of conversation. He wants you to be holy separated, set apart, held to a very high standard of righteousness in all manner of conversation because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. So the first biblical principle that we're going to be applying here just to this whole thing before I even get into the, the entertainment and, and all these other quotes that I'm going to be reading from regarding the, the 50s, we need to be, have a holy conversation and what I'm going to show to you tonight, what I'm going to prove to you is that the, the TV shows, the entertainment, the music, the movies, if we're going to be talking about those things, our conversation won't end up being holy because the TV shows that are out there today and the movies and everything else is, is just wicked and evil and are not things that we ought to be putting in front of our eyes. Now, I'm going to read you a quote here. Just to show, to show you the huge difference between the time frame of the 40s and 50s versus the time frame today. Listen to this. This is just a, a, a recollection someone writing about the 50s. It says, Though launched in the late 1940s, television and television culture and lore really boomed in the 1950s. So television became a big thing in the 50s. It was invented. It was kind of brought out for the, for the people in the 40s. But back in the 40s, it was much more expensive. I mean, just think about any technology, right? When it first comes out, it's always really expensive. So only rich people can afford it. I remember the, um, you know, all the new technologies that came out, CDs and laser discs. You remember the laser discs for the movies? Only people who had a lot of money can afford to have those types of things, which is why we never had them. But um, until later on, then they get much more um, price reasonably that, that anyone could get them. And it was the same thing with television. So in the 40s it came out, but not everyone had them. But it really boomed in the 1950s. In America, there were usually only three television stations to watch, all in black and white. And broadcasts generally only lasted from 6.30 a.m. till midnight. So think about that. Just, I mean, you have your choice of three, you know, if you're flipping the channels, you had three channels to choose from. And you could only watch television because there was only something being aired between 6.30 a.m. and midnight. And any other time, well, there's nothing, nothing being played. And listen to this, because this is probably the most shocking. I didn't even know this until I, until I read this for the, for the sermon. It says, most TV stations signed off each night with a Christian sermonette from a pastor, followed by the playing of the national anthem. Oh, how times have changed. Can you imagine watching TV and then them closing the broadcast with a little sermon? Preaching God's Word. Using the airwaves to preach God's Word. Now, I don't know what types of sermons were preached. I don't know if it was just some milquetoast pastor, you know, preaching a bunch of garbage. I have no idea. But just the fact that they would even have a Christian pastor getting airtime giving a, a small sermon, a mini sermon, on, the, on just public broadcast is amazing to me. I mean, I grew up in the, in the 80s watching TV, and you didn't see any of that. I'm going to keep reading here. Now it says, and think about this with your conversation. And not just your conversation, but... What gets put into your head, and this is, this is what was not put on TV back then. It says, issues like domestic abuse, 
substance abuse, date rape, incest, infidelity, infertility, dysmenorrhea, impotence, miscarriages, and pedophilia. And this is a quote from this person, now blithely popular daytime TV themes were almost never discussed publicly then, based on the social idea that one shouldn't air one's dirty linen in public. Indeed, within some homes of the 1950s, sexuality in general was never alluded to at any time, even with teenagers entering puberty. Back then, there were topics that people just didn't talk about at all because it wasn't, it wasn't socially acceptable even within the home to be speaking about these things. You know, the Bible says not to even speak of the things that are done in, of them in secret. The wickedness that goes on, we shouldn't even be talking about. If we shouldn't even be talking about these things, then should we be consuming them with our eyes? and hearing about them with our ears in front of a TV show. I mean, think about that. And, and think about all these things. And these are commonplace today. Domestic abuse, right? I think a lifetime pops into my mind right away. I, know, I mean, I have, no, I, I have no idea what TV is like today, but I know that, that, you know, one or two decades ago, Lifetime was that channel that always had, it was always this pro-women with the men always looking like they're, you know, they're, they're jerks and they're, they're beating up their wife and all this other stuff. And there's all these dramas on, on Lifetime. Domestic abuse, substance abuse, right? People doing drugs. That's commonplace and probably just about every sitcom that's out there today. Um, date rape incest, you know, all these things. I'm not going to go through all these um, again. But the, the, all these bad things, weird things, you know, infidelity, talking about adultery, right? People not being faithful to their spouse, not even mentioned, not brought up, not one time. And people say, oh yeah, but it still happens, so why not talk about it? Why not talk about it is because we're supposed to be keeping our communication pure, we're supposed to be holy. That's why you don't talk about it. It's not that you're burying your head in the sand. It's that we're holding yourself to a standard of saying, I don't want to talk about filth. I don't want filth just entering my mind and, and taking the attention of my thoughts to even be thinking about these things. Because I reject them. I reject wickedness. I reject sin. I reject pedophilia. I reject this rape. I reject, you know, we don't need to understand it. We know that it's a sin and we know that it's wrong. End of discussion. That's the mentality that they had there. Look, you don't need to air any dirty laundry. If stuff like that happens, yeah, we know and we need to deal with it in the, in the, in the proper way through, through the law system, the judicial system. We don't need to make a TV show about it. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. The Bible says in Philippians 1.27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And then again in Philippians 3.20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where our conversation ought to be. It ought to be on heavenly things, not on the filth of this world. 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse number 12. The Bible reads, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation. We need to hold ourselves to a standard where we are the example of, to, uh, to all the believers of how a believer should act and behave in the things that you speak, in your conversation, in your manners. It says in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. If you're pure, you'll keep a pure mind. You keep yourself uh, pure from the, from the wickedness. and the sin. You don't need to learn about all the sin and all the filth. We don't need you. Know, the Bible says to be, um, to be simple concerning that which is evil. We don't need to have a great understanding of this. You don't need to study wickedness in order to reprove it or in order to help people out with it. You don't need to know all about the depth. You know, I've heard this criticism from people in the past of, oh, how do you think you're going to be able to help some 
you know, someone who's strung out on drugs or anything else if you haven't done it before. And that's why a lot of people who are coming out of addiction think that they are the only ones that are going to be able to help someone else out because that, well, I've been through it. It's fine if you want to help people out, but don't think that you have to have all of the knowledge of sin in order to help people to understand, hey, it's wickedness and it's bad and you need to just cut it out of your life. We have too many crutches and too many people trying to, to you know, getting coddled and baby when they need to just man up and, and deal with their issues and just deal with it. Look, I used to have issues myself with, with substances and with, with cigarettes and things, but when it came time to dropping it, I stopped doing it. And I'm not some superhuman person. It's just something that you have to decide to do. So if you're involved in any type of addiction, you have to be able to just say, I'm not going to do this anymore. You don't need to have everyone saying, oh, I understand how hard it is. And, you know, and giving you all these excuses as to why it's going to be so easy to go right back into doing it again. In the, in the AA and NA, they always tell the people, look, you know, 95% of the people that go through the program are going to go right back into drugs. You're, you're setting them up for failure right from the beginning. Say, oh, we're just being honest with them, telling the truth. Look, you're not encouraging them whatsoever. You say, look, you need to get this crap out of your life and be done with it and not even look back and move forward. And you can help people through that whether or not you have all of the knowledge of being deep into sin or not. You don't have to have that knowledge. The Bible gives us all the knowledge that we need about sin in order to avoid it. Whatever the sin is, it doesn't matter what the sin is, we have enough knowledge and wisdom in the pages of this book. It's like telling a pastor, you can't preach against alcohol because you've never been drunk before. You don't need to be drunk. You could read Proverbs 23 and understand, hey, this is the effects of drinking alcohol. Your eyes shall behold strange women. Your heart's going to utter perverse things. I believe God's word. It's the truth. And that is what's going to happen. You don't need to have experienced that to say, yep, that's true. Yep, that's true, 100%. Because the Bible says so. And that's all you need to know. You need to be able to tell people that. Look at what this is doing to your life. Stop doing it. Get, get it out. Get right with God. That's all that needs to be done. Let's reread verse 12 here. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation. So should we be speaking and talking about things that are pure and charity and, and spirit and faith and purity? Till I come, give attendance to reading to exhortation, to doctrine. He's saying, this is what you need to occupy your time with until I get there. Reading, exhortation, and doctrine. Exhorting other people, helping other people out. When you're, and look, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I'm not just against all entertainment or, or all ways of being able to have a little bit of fun and spending time with people. Whether that be sitting down to even, you know, I, I have a television set. Now, I don't have cable. I don't watch any public programming. But we have a television set to watch documentaries, to learn some things, you know, um, some, some programming for the kids so that, that's, that's benign, that's not, uh, not teaching them a bunch of garbage or false things from this world. We have things like that. But that's not how we ought to be spending our time. I mean, that's, that, that's, that should be a very small, small, small percentage of the, of the way that you spend your time. It's not going to be in, you know, the daily TV show. Your people get caught up in their series and their programs. Oh, I got to watch this. And they sit down and they make time every single day for 30 minutes, an hour, up to two hours a day. I got to watch my show. I got to watch my show. I got to watch my show. And they make it a daily routine. And even, even if it's not filthy, which I'm going to prove to you tonight that it is. I, could, I don't care what you're watching. Almost everything that's out there today is garbage. And you, you'll probably, you might be blown away after, after I, I've, got, I've got some facts here for you. But you spend that much time watching this stuff. And if you're a Christian, you know, I mean, I expect the world to do that. I mean, that's what the world does. And the world has their own entertainment and everything like that. But as a Christian, you're going to devote and, and plan out and section off an hour of your day just for, for television. How much of, the, of your day are you 
sectioning off and blocking off for reading God's Word. You say you have a show that's, that's nothing wrong with it, fine. But are you spending more time watching some television program than you are reading your Bible, praying to God? If you are, you're in sin. That's, that's, that's not right. You shouldn't just be blocking off all of this entertainment time for yourself and be focusing on you then, like the Bible says here, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. There are things that your time can be much better spent and we need to make sure that God is not taking a back seat with our priority level of just saying, well, I need to be entertained first and then if I have time and I can get around to it, then I'll think about hearing from God. Because the television programming is just that. It's programming. You are receiving instructions from the TV set whether you realize it or not. Just as much as other people rub off on you, and that's why you want to surround yourself with godly Christian people, because that'll rub off on you. If you, if you surround yourself with the, with the unsaved people of the world, guess what? The way that they talk, the way that they think, the things that they talk about, it's all going to rub off on you. Whether you like it or not, that's the way that we're designed. That's the way that we're built. That will happen. And if you're spending a bunch of time in front of a program and watching just a bunch of unsaved people do their unsaved stuff, that's going to rub off on you too. You say, oh, it's just a fishing show or whatever. How much time are you spending with that? That's going to rub off on you wanting to go and just do these other frivolous things that really don't mean anything. It's going to waste your time instead of serving God. Now let's compare that. So what, what did I read already? Yeah, all these things that they don't, they never would even mention on television before. Look at the difference in purity. I mean, the, none of these things were even brought up. In the television shows, you weren't being exposed to all this filth and nonsense when you'd watch the TV shows back then. But now, I mean, it has to be in there in order to get people to even watch it. People today will be like, oh yeah, that stuff's dull. You think about back in the 50s, um, the popular shows were shows like I Love Lucy, where they literally had, whenever they would do... Um, Scenes they would do, they would do the, the you know on a TV show because it was set in like the home or whatever, and it was the interaction between um, the two characters. And then one of the things that was real shocking back then was when they even when they even did a scene in the bedroom because that was way off limits and that was taboo and rightfully so. And look, I'm not saying they should have done this, but when they did do this, they had separate beds. They weren't in bed together even when they would shoot their, their, their scene that, that took place with conversations happening like in the bedroom of the house as the scene. They were separate beds. That's how, how you could say, pure that, that they were trying to be back in the 50s. I'm not saying that, that that is correct and right and they should be doing that. But what I'm saying is now you have people on like wasn't it, what was it, um, what was that one Chicago TV show, it was like ER or one of those, where they like had nudity in a bedroom scene or something, like on daytime or on primetime TV? Was it, am I right? Was it like ER? Do you, do you remember that or no? It was like, I think it was like 10 years ago already or something. I don't even remember where there was like some kind of, it, and now it's just like normal. All of the standards that they've had have all just becoming relaxed and then just, you know, more and more nudity is acceptable, more and more foul language, topics that you talk about. All of this stuff is just becoming more and more acceptable because we're becoming so depraved as a society. People would flip their lids back in the 50s if they were to see a television program today. They would say, what kind of junk, pornographic garbage is this being broadcast to televisions where there are children present in the home. And it would not be stood for, and it shouldn't be stood for today. But people's minds are in the gutter as far as what's right and what's wrong. Probably ever since they stopped having the sermonettes being aired on the TV. 
Back then it was, I love Lucy, leave it to Beaver or the honeymooners, right? And again, people always fully clothed. And, and, and I'm not saying that any of those shows are righteous shows and Christian shows that you should be watching. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying this to point the difference out between that and since I don't know what's on the TV today, I, did, I just did a, a search for you know, television programs 2016 and, and here's what came up. And, I'm, and there was a whole list of things. I didn't write them all out. But just an example of what's out there today, because that's what I did with the 50s shows too, just to get an example. Now, I've heard and seen all of those shows that I mentioned. Here are the names of some of the shows that are out there today. Lucifer. Lucifer, I heard about, is a show where basically it's the devil. It's Satan. And they portray him as kind of just a misunderstood guy. Right? That, that he's the, and, and it's like um, the Luciferian religion. I mean, they, they look at him as, as an angel of light, as he's actually a good guy. Oh, hey, he tried to help Adam and Eve out by giving them the knowledge of good and evil. That, that mean God didn't want them to have knowledge. But see, Lucifer, he wants them to have knowledge. He's just trying to help. He's being a good guy. He's just a little bit misunderstood. And that's what's be, this is what's being aired on the Wayward Waves today. Another TV show, Angel from Hell. We have Lucifer, Angel from Hell, American Idol, and The Vampire Diaries are examples of shows being aired on public broadcast today. You notice something a little odd there? Now it's just openly satanic. Openly God-hating. Openly have nothing to do with righteousness or morality. It's all, let's just see how wicked we can get and how perverted and, and how much into sin we could just show things on the TV. In a matter of 60 years. And not only are today's TV shows overtly satanic. I mean, just the names alone are promoting Satanism. They're also pushing extremely hardcore the sodomite agenda. The reprobate, because that's who's in charge of this stuff anyways. That's who's in charge of the television programming is the perverted sodomites. And they're trying to defile your pure mind if you're a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, they're definitely trying to defile your mind and get you reprobate too because they're recruiters. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, flip over 2 Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> verse number 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Yeah, the story of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, where the, where the men of the city tried to, to rape enforce the angels that came into town that were sent there to get Lot out that wanted to, to force them with their, with their filthy, wicked ways that God ended up destroying with raining fire and brimstone from heaven, destroying utterly everybody in that city because they were all wicked they're an example. They're an ensample unto those later. Say, oh, that happened a long time ago. Oh, that was Old Testament. Yeah, the reason why that was even recorded as a story in the Old Testament is because it's an ensample for those that want to do the same thing today. Those that later want to turn America into Sodom. Guess what happened? It's not going to be good. But look at verse 7, and delivered just Lot. Lot was saved. He was justified by faith in the Lord. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Our conversation is supposed to be holy. The wicked, the reprobate, the sodomite, they have filthy conversation. And that vexed Lot. And if you're a Christian today, you ought to be vexed. It ought to bother you. It ought to trouble you listening to the conversation of the wicked. 
It says, For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Well, guess what? When you're watching a television, television programming that's out there today, odds are you're watching programming that has a sodomite in the programming, whether the, the actual character in the movie or in the show is being portrayed as a sodomite or the actor themselves is a sodomite. And if you can just sit there and watch it and have that not bother you and not even be vexed, you better, you better check yourself. Lot was living in Sodom and it was around him all the time. You want to talk about being desensitized. He was around it all the time and it still vexed him and bothered him. Christian, that better bother you too because it's wicked, it's perverted, it's weird, it's filthy, it's disgusting, it's abominable. I have a list of over 300 TV shows that at least once had homo characters in the show. There was a lot more information on this on the list that I found and it had like who the characters were and what happened and all this other nonsense that I don't really care about. Some, I was just kind of surprised that someone actually took the time to go through all of these TV shows. And this dates back, let's see what's here. It goes all the way back to, it's like 1970-something, 1980-something. Of course. Oh, this is the last page. Okay, 1972 is the earliest. But the, the, the oldest few shows from the 1970s are all like Australian. It was all in Australia. It wasn't until the 1980s in America that anything, any reference to like a sodomite or a transvestite or something of that wicked, perverted nature was even brought up on a TV show. Now, most of these, even, you know, this is the very last page, and it still has the 2000s on here. This is all recent. The vast majority of the TV programming that have these characters that are, that are these sodomites and transvestites and just whatever weird, wicked character in it is all a, recent, a much more recent phenomenon. But I'm going to read these off. I'm not going to read all over 300 of them. But I'm going to read these off because I'll tell you right now, if you're watching these TV shows, you're not right with God. Because if you're watching a show, you say, oh, but it only happened a couple times. I say, look, yeah, but you're watching a show regularly. Even if it only happens a couple times, guess what? They're getting their programming across into your head. Guess what? That is not something you say, oh, I didn't know they were going to do it. Just because you don't know doesn't mean that it's any less wrong for you to be absorbing the wickedness and the indoctrination of this world with their filthy sodomite agenda trying to get you to accept it as an alternative lifestyle. You can't undo the things that you see and that you hear. And you are willingly putting yourself down in front of the world's programming, in front of the sodomite programming. And if you are watching any of these shows today, you are not right with God. And it's starting here with, with when the shows started. So starting in 2016, there's these like new shows. Already, 2016, what are we, three months in? And there's already shows on here with homo characters. And the list I tried, and, and I didn't vet this because I don't really care, but if someone took the time and they're writing down all these characters, it's probably true. And they're, see, they're promoting this as a good thing. So I have no reason to doubt this. They're promoting this, you know, this is like the LGBT, you know, so proud that there's all these queers in... in in TV today. But let's read these because maybe one of these will hit home with you. I don't know. Recovery Road, The Shannara Chronicles, Crashing, The Magicians. You know, the Bible puts magicians to death, but you know, let's just watch The Magicians. Legends of Tomorrow, Billions, Shades of Blue, Zoe Ever After, Shadow Hunters, Telenovela, Superstore, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Dr. Ken, Cheetah in August, This Life, Deutschland 83, Versailles, 
Blind Spot, Home Fires, Jessica Jones, Flesh and Bones, London Spy, Master of None, You, Me, and the Apocalypse, Cuffs, Grandfathered, Code Black, Quantico, Rosewood, Scream. I've never heard of any of these, by the way. No, I have no idea what any of these are. <laughs> So I don't know, maybe, maybe someone listening online is going to hear these. But look, if you're listening to this, get right with God. It, it takes a long time before, I, and I'm not going to get that far before we get into to the, the programs that, that I would know. Scream Queens, Boy Meets Girl, Club de Cuervos. I'm, somebody, I'm not even going to read some of these. Glitch, Mr. Because if, if you can't figure it out just off of the name of some of these on your own, by seeing them, then you've got bigger problems. Scream, another period, complications, clipped, unreal, sense eight, Aquarius, Grace and Frankie, weird loners, younger, one big happy, the royals, unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, dig, the returned, American crime, Olympus, banana, Cucumber, I thought those were vegetables. I guess they're TV shows now. Backstrom, Eye Candy, Empire, Babylon, Marry Me, Finding Carter, Glue, Carmilla, The 100, Jane the Virgin, Transparent, Faking It, Madam Secretary, The Mysteries of Laura, The Flash, Red Band Society, Gotham, so I assume that's a Batman thing, right? That's real popular, I'm sure. Kingdom. I mean, you can't even have comic books anymore without, without the sodomite agenda being brought into it. How to Get Away with Murder, Chasing Life, Halt and Catch Fire, The Strain, Dominion, Outlander, Young and Hungry, Tyrant, The Night Shift, Penny Dreadful, Black Sails, Looking, Janet King, Star Cross, True Detective, The Fall, Peaky Blinders, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Wentworth. Now I'm going to start to find stuff that, that I might have even heard of before. Because I'm not going to read off all of these. There's just tons and tons. I mean, look at all of these shows. All of them have had some kind of filth character in it. And I, like I said, I don't care if it happened once or twice or three times or if they're just a regular part of the show. It doesn't even matter because if you are regularly watching this crap, this garbage, you are allowing yourself to, to, to get this, this wicked conversation into your mind. Orange is the new black. Yeah, see, some of these are like, and that's the other thing, some of these I think are like Netflix or Amazon specials, and, and some of them are regular TV program, whatever. I don't care. People are watching all that stuff anyways. Orange is the new black. What, what else is on here that I've heard of? Chicago Fire. So I have to keep going back earlier. American Horror Story. Game of Thrones. Teen Wolf. I didn't even know they made that a TV show. I thought that was a movie back from the 80s. But I guess they redo all the 80s stuff, right? Parenthood. The Walking Dead. I know I've heard of that one. The Walking Dead with, with homo characters in it, apparently. Law and Order, L.A. Glee. Glee, by the way, I, I remember when I was looking this up, Glee is just, I mean, there's like all kinds of characters. It's like, this is just like, just pure trash sodomite throughout the whole show, apparently. I don't really know what it is. Apparently some singing thing or whatever, but... It goes back even to, I mean, Sons of Anarchy. I know that was a real popular show. True Blood. You know, these are all things that I've heard of. Look, it, you can't ex 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 escape it. Dexter. Heroes. Big Love. All of this. And, and look, it's not just a sodomite thing that, that's filthy in these shows either. This is just like about the worst. I mean, how much more depraved are you going to get? I mean, you're going to say, oh, well, that's fine as long as it doesn't have bestiality in it. I mean, because that's, that's about the next step down from homosexuality. That's about, that's about the only step lower you can get as far as how depraved are you willing to, to, to put things in front of your face and be, and be subjected to. 
It ought to vex you. It's funny, there was only one show on here I was kind of surprised at when I, because I, I, I briefly, as I was compiling this list and putting it into a printable form, it had uh, The Sopranos on there. That is a show that I used to watch back, back when I was worldly, and I watched that whole thing, and I was like, The Sopranos? But what was interesting about that is that the only, now that show is wicked for other reasons, but that is the only show that I saw on this list that would have been acceptable because the only re the, the, what it said about the homosexual character that was in Sopranos, he got killed because he was a homo. <laughs> that, was, that was the only one. Where it was, okay, now look, I'm not endorsing the Sopranos because like I said, it's wicked for many other reasons. With, with, with the, the murder and adultery and, and drug use and everything else that just, that's just you don't need to be putting your mind in front of. But at least that one, the only homo that was on it got whacked, <laughs> right? But, that, but still, that shouldn't even be entertainment. That should not be entertaining. It's, it's wicked and perverted, and, and even, even the death, I mean, putting someone to death, that's not, that's not entertainment. It shouldn't be entertainment. That's not how you should be spending your time. The more modern you get with these TV shows, as I was trying to point out, then the more integrated these characters are. And they just try to normalize it. Such a, such a small percentage of sodomites overall in the whole country, yet they try to make you think that it's normal and they introduce them in all these shows. I mean, look, is that not, I mean, over 300 TV shows? God help us. Let's read another quote here. This was kind of interesting. Maybe I'll skip. No, I won't skip it. I'm going to go through it real quickly, though. I'll read this. So, uh, continuing on here, it says, Most Americans got all their information from the same limited sources. And this is something to think about because this is an issue. But the, the, the writer seems to think that these problems kind of solve today. But he says, Most Americans got all their information from the same limited sources, three TV networks, AM radio, and a slender score of mainstream popular magazines. This meant public tastes and political leanings enjoyed very little diversity compared to today. It is scant exaggeration to say everybody watched and read the same things. So back then, I mean, because, because there were so few choices for like their entertainment stuff, he says basically everybody was watching the same thing. I mean, think about the power that was wielded by the people in the media, and that's why it's gotten so corrupt. Is because they realized, wow, we have this huge influence that because of this technology never existed before. I mean, the only way you could get something like that to happen would be through maybe state-run print, right? Like newspapers. If you could say, we're the only game in town and have a monopoly on that, then you could control the flow of information, which is what they did too. But now they realize with the television, they can just broadcast it and control how people thought which is what, that's why it's called television programming. <laughs> it is, you're being, pro it's a program. You are being programmed into the way that you think. I mean, wh why should you be spending your time thinking about these perverts at all anyways? You shouldn't even be crossing your mind. You shouldn't be thinking about the, the bizarre, weird things that are done of them in secret. Yet now it's just being broadcast publicly. And it influences the way you think in general. It'll desensitize you to sin and get you to be more accepting of it. I'll keep reading here. It says, This uh, relative paucity of media meant that public opinion could be very carefully shaped indeed. And the news press in those days could and did withhold virtually any information from the public that they saw fit. For example, the extramarital, extramarital dalliances and, sh and shady malfeasances of U.S. presidents and public figures. So basically, they didn't spread the gossip of the, of the, of the, you know, the, the wicked things that would happen. They didn't make that public news because they would withhold that. Now, again, I'm not saying everything they did was good or bad, whatever, um, as far as when it comes to holding people in office accountable. I think they ought to be held accountable, but there's still a balance here of what they're going to allow on the television because it's improper, it's inappropriate, it's not something that we should just be, 
you know, gossiping about and talking about versus holding someone accountable. There's a, there's a balance to be had there. But they were using a censorship over the TV programming then because they held a very high standard. And mind you, it was, it was a standard that lined up much more closely with the Bible, way, way more closely with the Bible than today did. Today does. It's a had, let's say, something as... Uh, yeah, and this kind of shows you the liberal mind of the, of the person writing this. Had, let's say, something as worrisome as global warming, Ebola, or serial killers loomed in the 1950s, the media could have very easily blackouted that information or many pertinent details thereof altogether from public awareness. This enforced innocence meant that most Americans were fiercely, unquestioningly patriotic, and most media of the era showed them little of the goings on outside the USA. Now again, this, and this is very powerful, and this is dangerous, and this should open up your eyes to how much power that, that boob tube really has. That television set, and, and how much they're able to control just because people are relying on that as their source of information. And um, it, it really does have a lot of power. It was in the 1950s that Americans adopted unquestioningly the impression of themselves as the best country on earth. And it was that decade, especially, in which a certain insularity crept across the country, with Americans becoming less and less interested in what other countries were doing. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing if you were just talking about minding your own business and staying out of foreign affairs and just focusing in on, the, on your own country and your own problems. There's nothing wrong with that. It says U.S. Pre pre presidents before the 50s might have spoken with a quasi-British accent, as Woodrow Wilson and FDR did, but after VE Day and VJ Day, they never did again. They didn't want to be associated with, with the Brits at that, after that point is what he's saying. But um, this is an interesting point about the power of media, and I, I left that in there to make this point because we just need to be aware of that. You know, the television programming is very powerful and people are controlling what you are watching when you voluntarily sit in front of it. There's an agenda. As I mentioned this morning with the, you know, the, the sermon on the New World Order, Satan has an agenda. And Satan has his hands, he has his puppets in the entertainment industry. And he got them in there very early on. Trying to, to corrupt the minds of of a whole society, of a whole bunch of people. And think about how easily he can do that. Before the, the great technological advances, it's a lot harder to spread your filth because you have to do it, you have to attack more people that have influence over people, right? Because Satan's going to attack, he's not going to attack the low-level person who, who doesn't really influence anybody at all anyways. He doesn't care about that person. Satan's going to attack the people. That's why he attacks, you know, pastors, uh, especially that are doing good work for God, or people that have just a wide influence that are, that are really doing a lot of good. He's going to attack them the hardest. And he's going to attack other people or use other people that are already like children of the devil that have influence over other people and that get involved in politics or get involved in other areas where they can, they can impact a lot of people. He's going to use those people. And with the television, with the programming, with this broadcasting, he, it's made it a lot easier for him. Because now all of a sudden, you could, he could control an aspect where it's being pumped into the homes of like the vast majority of the people in the country. And now getting into the world with the technology you have, with the internet, with the, with the television, with the music, with all the entertainment industry, it's just being pumped right into the homes. Continue on here. I'm running out of time. Speaking of radio, it says in the 1950s, uh, I'm going to skip that. It's just talking about how there were hits. Well, I'll, just, I'll read it. Speaking of radio, in the 1950s, the weekly hit list of pop songs were compiled at the local level by the station DJs themselves. This meant you could have regional hits, something unheard of today with corporations owning everything and the net homogenizing everything. Back then, a particular song could be a smash in L.A. or New York and never, ever heard in Texas. Mom says that pop songs in 1961 Texas lagged two years behind the songs that were popular on the West Coast. So what they're saying is because things weren't interconnected as much and there wasn't global media as much on the radio, 
there were songs that were popular in one part of the country that other people didn't even hear about. Now it's, it's unheard of because it's the same stuff that's being pushed. On, you know, when new bands come up, whoever is, is the executive making the decision, we are going to promote this band because they've sold their souls to us or whatever. They pump that out and now they get people to like music just because they just play them new stuff. Not because they, they are getting a following necessarily, it's just because they're being promoted and commercialized to make money off of. That's the way the music industry works today. And um, that's not the way it was back then. And now because of that, there's just people, it's just gotten more and more wicked because of the evil people uh, behind the scenes that are controlling the media. Um, speaking of music, because this is going to be the last, yeah, I got, I got two points left. I spent a lot of time on the TV and the movie thing, part of the entertainment. But music has changed dramatically also. You know, people who were popular back in the 50s era would be like the Frank Sinatras, right? And that, that style of music, which is much more tame compared to today. Now look, Frank Sinatra was a devil. He had, he had really wicked lyrics. You listen, I've listened to some of his songs. I used to like some of them. Now they're mild compared to today, but they were still God-hating lyrics. And then Elvis, just to give you an example again of, of the differences between the, uh, the old time and today. Here's a, here's a quote. It says, The New York Daily News reported that Elvis gave an exhibition that was suggestive and vulgar, tinged with a kind of animalism that should be confined to dives and bordellos, while the San Francisco Chronicle deemed it in appalling taste. This was the criticism of Elvis Presley, you know, the king of rock and roll. His performances, especially early on, the people who were reporting for just new, your average newspaper, or the, not even just your average, I mean, the San Francisco Chronicle, the, the New York Daily News, I mean, these are big publications, right? People who lived in that culture and, and the people who were reading those newspapers were your probably white class, you know, uh, or white class, middle class, white American. Again, I mean, it's, in, in, you know, I'm not bringing a race and all this stuff because back in the 50s, there was a segregation, there was all this other stuff that was going on. I'm trying to you know, focus on the stuff that was positive, but we had um, here, they're, they're, they're analyzing Elvis's performance saying that it was suggestive and vulgar because of the way that he danced on stage. And you know what? I would say that they were right. People might look at me today like I'm crazy, but you know what? That's what people were saying back then. You know what? That's vulgar. He shouldn't be dancing like that. He shouldn't be moving himself suggestively that he has all these, you know, teenage girls screaming at him and, and, and whatever, like, because he's, he's, he's up there and doing these, these dances that are rebellious, especially for that time, because it wasn't the cultural norm, that even then when he ended up playing on the Ed Sullivan Show, which is a real popular TV show for musicians back then, was um, they only showed him above the waist on one of his performances because they were trying to, to keep it more pure for the audience. Because he had gotten so popular, they had to, they had to have him on the show. But if they were going to do it, they wanted to still try to keep it because they didn't like the... the, the the vulgar dancing that he did. Now, if you've listened to Elvis songs, I mean, he's a, here's a guy who's still singing gospel songs as, as a lot of his repertoire. In addition to other songs, you know, you can think about the, the lyrics and stuff. They're a lot more benign compared to today. Right? They're, they're not these overtly satanic songs. But this is the standard that was held in the 1950s. This was deemed unacceptable. And I would say, good on them for having a high standard. Now, the sta there is no standard anymore. The standard is just is bottomed out, and you, you have to look through the sludge to try to find where the bar is, because it's invisible. Compare that with today, with, with the standards. Think about the people like Madonna. That, that whore, that, that whores herself out, that, that does these 
dances and rituals with, with other women, with men. You know, she, she, she displays things on the stage and acts things out. And people call that art and it's wickedness. It's perverted. Or the, the newer singers, right? Like the Miley Cyrus or the Lady Gaga who literally, they, they, they come short of actually fornicating on stage. They'll show nudity. They'll show graph, just just disgusting graphic portrayals. And even that, uh, that Katy Perry, like, was it, I think it was last year's Super Bowl, came in like the great whore riding the beast at the halftime show. I don't know if anyone picked up on that or not. I didn't watch it. I, I caught a video from someone else that put it up because it's not like I don't watch the Super Bowl or any of that stuff. But someone had posted, pointed it out, and I saw it, and I was just like, that's the great whore. And literally, these people do like satanic rituals as part of their performances in their concerts. They literally have people like dressed up in Baphomet masks and these bizarre sexual innuendo and, and, and dancing and, and it's just completely out in the open Satanism. Satanic filth and wickedness and it's accepted. And parents go out and buy the music for their kids to listen to. It's ridiculous. No standard whatsoever. Okay, I'm going to close with this. There's a lot more I would have liked to get into on the music, but I've preached sermons on music in the past. Was, and I kind of tied this in with, with entertainment is drugs and drug use. Here's a quote. It says, The hallucinogen LSD had been discovered in 1947 and in the 1950s was entirely legal in the USA, though at that time it was seen as exclusively an adjunct to psychotherapy. So it was completely legal, but it wasn't being used recreationally. It was only used in, in the psychotherapy realm to try to help people out because they're experimenting with the drug. It says, Definitely not a street or recreational or cultural drug. Marijuana, heroin, and cocaine were then still thought of as, don't know what that word is. It says, lurid vices of urban libertines and sordid fringe groups. They hadn't yet become commonplace and available in most suburban environments. So basically, they're saying that drug use wasn't very popular. It wasn't a big thing. It wasn't a big deal. You know, marijuana, heroin, all these other things that you hear about today, people weren't doing it. Why? I believe it's because of higher Christian standards. Now, we live in a day where smoking pot is now becoming acceptable. And you, you hear it even among Christians. They're starting to say, oh yeah, pot, you know, legalized pot, all this other stuff. Look, it's always being compared to alcohol. Unfortunately, we're using alcohol as the standard. Now look, it makes sense to me. If we should accept pot because we accept alcohol, yeah, that argument makes sense. Because I do believe that, that, uh, that pot isn't as bad as, as alcohol. I think it, causes le it doesn't cause as much damage as alcohol does. But why is alcohol the standard? Now, don't get me wrong, because I don't believe that either one of them should be illegal. Actually, I don't think drugs should be illegal at all. I think we should follow a model that is based off of the Bible, where the things that God said are illegal where basically you're doing harm upon someone else and you have to pay retribution when you steal things, when you do things of that nature, those are the uh, um, things that should be against the law. And God did not make every sin against the law, the law of the land. When, when you look at the way that he laid out what the law should be for the nation of Israel, we should be mimic, mimicking that. Now, but at the same time, just because I don't think that marijuana should be illegal, I don't think drinking alcohol should be illegal, I don't think any of the street drugs should be illegal, does not mean I'm going to condone them any day of the week. I do not think that smoking pot is just fine. I do not think that there's nothing wrong with it. I do not think, you know, jumping on this bandwagon, oh, it's like this miracle drug. No, it's not. No, it's not. You may be able to find some uses of it somewhere, whatever. But it's not the, the, the new miracle. Anybody that claims to have the miracle drug 
is the lie. It's not true. Nothing is the cure-all for everything. Nothing. The Bible says this, though, regarding drug use. It says, and it says statements like this. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's the last place we'll turn, and we're going to close with this, with this uh, chapter because I think there's too many Christians getting caught up in, the, in this you know, legalized pot thing and actually promoting it and thinking that it's not that bad and thinking that it's okay, and it's okay for Christians to smoke pot because it's not. It's not. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 1, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. So what's he talking about? He's talking about the rapture, right? He's saying, look, the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. But you know what? You're a children of light. You're a child of light. You are not of the darkness like they are of. So as a Christian, we need to be children of light. And let's continue on here as he, as he explains this. Verse number 6, Therefore, because you're a child of light, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. We're supposed to be sober and watching and waiting and expecting and looking for things to happen and being and paying attention to what's going on around us, paying attention to the signs of paying attention to everything that's happening around us. If he wants you to be sober and to be watching, do you think he wants you just going off and getting high? And having the giggles and getting the munchies <laughs> and laughing over stupid things because you're high, because you're stoned, because everything's just a big joke. Or going off and getting drunk and committing fornication and just playing and partying and just having a good old time when he says to watch and be sober. Look, you can apply that to any drug. It's not just drinking. When he says to be sober, Hey, when you're high on pot, you're not sober. When you're high on any drug, you're not sober. He says, watch and be sober. You need to be ready. You need to be sober. Verse number 7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. And you could add this, they that do drugs and everything else, they do drugs at night. But let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. That's the attitude that we need to have about drugs. Not we have to make it illegal. That's, I mean, that's a whole other topic and, and, and problem in and of itself. But it should not be acceptable for Christians to be behaving in a manner where they're smoking pot or drinking alcohol or anything like that. It's wickedness. We need to hold ourselves to a higher standard in our communication, not to vex our minds with the, with the filthy communication of the wicked like Lot did by putting this, this garbage in front of your face. The 50s had a lot better, a, a much better culture than we do today in America. If we could even get back to that, to 60 years ago, how much better things would be in this country. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the standard that you have given us. Dear Lord, we're not trying to, to say that the 50s had the standard that we need to abide by because your words have the standard we need to abide by, dear Lord. They were just much closer 60 years ago in this country than we are today. Lord, things have fallen so far, so fast. God, I pray that you would please help us to ignite a passion for people that are willing to stand by your word and to separate from this world, dear God, and, and to not get drugged down with the, with the sodomite, filthy agenda that's being pushed on, on the society today, but that we would stand tall and that we would stand in your word, dear God, and not allow to be, ourselves to be corrupted by the filth and the wickedness out there and not even speak of those things that are done of them in secret, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.